on this hot, steamy Sunday morning, but uh, good to have air conditioning. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. But it looks like we might get some relief this week, so pray hard we get some rain and keep cooler temperatures. But uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today, sing His praises. So if you will take your red hymnals, turn to hymn number 650 and 651. We will actually start on 651. We're going to go backwards in the book this morning instead of forward. So. Uh, we'll sing Jesus Loves the Little Children and Praise Him, Praise Him, all you little children. If you will, please stand and sing. <laughs> child welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who are, believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the one to the world because of these things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come of woe to the person to whom they come. Amen. All right, as we can 
continue singing this morning. Offertory hymn is hymn number 378. I am resolved. Would we'll please stand as we sing.
this is the number one thing in all of his sermons at the end, pastors have been talking about that we should do in, in accordance to what these situations are. Amen. Pray. The song this morning now is called Pray Now. Amen.
the need for prayer in these days in which we're living. Um, of course, prayer is always needed. It's always necessary. And uh, so what a great reminder. Thank you to the choir for that great, great reminder of that. So I hope you you see on your, your sermon outline there's several passages of scripture there. We're going to look at all of those and uh, we should be out. Um, you know, by, by work time tomorrow, will that work? Yeah, okay. Now you know me, we're not going to be long. I'm not a long preacher. I have kept these sermons this week, this month, you know, it's with the same outline. With the first, as, as Leslie pointed out, the first, the first mission opportunity is always pray, keeping it simple. Many years ago, somebody told me, I don't know if it was here or my former church, told me, Preacher, I like the way you preach. You preach simple. I said, well, that's not by design. That's, that's by necessity. I'm not smart enough to preach complicated. Uh, so that's just, that's just me. I'm a simple guy. And you, you all know that for many years, don't you? All right, so today we're, we're concluding our series in, in which we have looked at the, the biblical truth about some current issues. These current issues have, or continue to have a destructive impact on individuals and families and our nation and reality of the world. In the first Sunday, we talked about the, the issue of gender. And we're reminded that the Bible clearly teaches that God created each of us as he planned for us to be, and that is either male or female. And our, 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 we, we, our first uh, mission opportunity to pray for those who are struggling with, with their identity. and Pray that they will seek godly counsel and, and, uh, and, and that will lead them to see themselves as God created them. Second Sunday, we talked about the issue of abortion, and we were reminded by Scripture that clearly that every person conceived in the womb was created by God himself, and no one has the right to destroy that precious life. And we were reminded that we need to pray for those uh, who are struggling with that decision. Pray they will, they will take that baby to term, and also pray for those who have who have uh, had abortions and still struggle with that because uh, they need they need the love and, and the grace and mercy of Jesus. Last Sunday we talked about the issue of homosexuality and we saw very clearly that in every reference um, in Scripture to homosexuality, uh, homosexual behavior, it condemns it. Scripture condemns it every time as an abomination against God. Again, we we saw that we need to pray for those who who struggle with that issue in their life, and, and pray that uh, you know, like all of us that have a propensity to sin in one area or another, uh, we need we need to pray that we don't give in to our temptations, and we pray for those who struggle with that issue. Amen. So today we're going to talk about the. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about the sexualization of children in our society. And in doing so, we're going, to, we're going to answer these same three questions. Now, next Sunday, I start another sermon series. There won't be the same outline every week. You may like this, but I haven't found an outline. I haven't, haven't in studying, I haven't seen, oh, this will work each Sunday. This was kind of obvious. So anyway, the first question, of course, is what is going on? Well, without a doubt, there is an evil attempt to sexualize children and teenagers in our nation. So how are they being corrupted? How are they doing this? The simplest thing they've done is to normalize the bizarre. Normalize what goes against the Bible and is also contrary to science and biology. 
We've seen that over the last, it's been a quick transition in that area. Over the last 20, I don't know, 20, 30 years, uh, where everything has seemed to be normal. And if you don't accept it as normal, then there's something wrong with you. So anyway, and here's one of the examples. In some public libraries, not any around, one, any around here so far, some public libraries around America, drag queens are hosting story hours for children where grown men dressed in women's sexual outfits and wear excessive makeup read books to the children promoting gay, lesbian, and transgender lifestyle to children as young as three years old. Every time I've seen that, I'm saying, what kind of parent takes their child to that? Amen. Now, this is done for one reason. To indoctrinate young children into accepting these sinful lifestyles as normal and encourages them even to dress up like the opposite sex. Amen. It promotes sinful, deviant behavior. There's a great book, if you've never read it, I encourage you to. Erwin Lutzer, who at one time was pastor of the Moody Church, um, in Chicago, in his book, We Will Not Be Silenced, he quotes one drag queen where such events takes place um, who made a disgusting admission to the parents and children attending. Here's what he said to them. I'm here to let you know that this event is something that's going to be very beautiful. Well, that's questionable in my mind. In my mind. And for the children and the people that supported it are going to realize that this is going to be the grooming of the next generation. Are you familiar with the term grooming? Grooming is a word used to describe the effort to desensitize children to the sexual abuse of others. Mm. Further, I, you may have seen this on the news. There's a video clip from a Gray Pride transgender parade on the news where the participants marching down the street in dressed or half-dressed, almost undressed, very disgusting ways, chanting, we are coming for your children. Did you see that? We must take them at their word and protect children against that evil. Amen. We have to take them at their word. <clears throat> In some areas, being transgender is being encouraged as, as normal. And here's the tragic part. Oftentimes, parents are intentionally not allowed to be a part of this conversation. In some school districts, not in your in here around here that I've seen. Not around here. Let me make sure I've clarified that. In some school districts, employees are forced to affirm the students' transgender thoughts and call the students by their chosen name of the opposite sex, and teachers are not allowed to tell the students' parents they're doing this. Further, the National Education Association has partnered with other groups to produce materials advocating automatic affirmation of gender identities, name changes, and desired pronouns, regardless of the parents' concerns. Now, let me say this. As far as I know, <clears throat> the majority of teachers and administrators in schools are good moral people who disagree with this evil indoctrination of children. So pray that God will strengthen these teachers to remain faithful. Amen. Because they are under tremendous pressure. And don't think it will only happen in big cities and faraway places. Be on guard before it starts happening in our area. Amen. We can never assume that it won't happen here. So pray for those who stand against such nonsense, such evil, evil attack on our children because it just ticks me off. I'm going to be honest with you. This is pure evil. Pray, pray for these teachers. 
pray for them. Pray for these administrators who are standing against this because they are going to have to be, they're going to have to stand strong and to do so is going to cost them Amen. in some way or another. Another issue, sadly, in some states, minors are allowed to have hormone therapy to transition them to the opposite sex and even have surgery because they felt they were transgender. Minors, under 18, by the way. Now, here's what studies have shown about that. A student comes in and says that they feel like they're the opposite sex and, and they may go through some counseling they go through, they're given some, some hormone therapy. They begin to talk about, possibly talk about surgery. But here's what studies have shown. Studies have shown that 80 to 95% of those who at some point identify as transgender end up realizing that they actually are their created sex. Why and why in the world is our nation, in some states in our nation, allowing such stuff to go on in our children and teenagers. 19-year-old Chloe Cole, you may have seen her on television recently, but they began attempting to, tra to transition to a man at the age of 12, underwent a mastectomy at the age of 15, says she has suffered lifelong, lifelong irreversible harm and has called medical transition of minors one of the biggest medical scandals in the history of the United States of America. Amen. People need to pay for this, folks. Amen. The good news is that people are waking up to the dangers being done to children and teenagers. 22 states, now this is the good news, 22 states have passed laws banning gender transitions in minors. Amen. We should be thankful that sadly many of these states are facing law court battles because of this. <coughs> but here's the sad part. If 22 have passed these laws, there are 28 states that allow minors to medically transition to the opposite sex. I'm going to quote somebody you've never heard me quote in a sermon before because he's about as liberal as liberal gets. His name is Bill Maher. He has a show on HBO. I saw a clip of this. Bill Maher, and he is extremely liberal politically, but all this stuff drives him crazy. And he made this statement. He said, I'm so thankful my parents didn't follow along with this, with this mindset. Because I wanted to be a pirate as a boy, and they would have taken me in for eye removal surgery and peg leg surgery. <laughs> Man, children are not emotionally and mentally able to make such drastic decisions. They, they claim you gotta, you got to trust the children on this. No, you don't. You listen to them. You talk to them about what they're feeling. But you don't rush them off to have some life-altering things done to them that really cannot be undone. Amen. Here's some further good news. Doctors in many European nations are leading the way to stop gender, gender transitions in teenagers. I praise God for that. Amen. Children should never be allowed to make these life-altering decisions. Adults should never encourage them to do it. Amen. It must be stopped. Well, if that's not, you know, I haven't depressed you enough already. I'm not going to depress you anymore. We're getting ready to go what the Bible says. I, I could have gone on for an hour or two on what's going on. Amen. But I wanted to choose just a few things. These are just a few ways that our society is not protecting the children and is, in fact, abusing them. Amen. And we, as, as Christians, as churches, must stand up Amen. and say, it's got to stop. Amen. Knowing we're going to be called hateful and bigots and everything else. 
But if somebody who wants to mutilate children and destroy their life <clears throat> wants to call me hateful, I'll wear that as a badge of honor Amen. every single time. Now, what does the Bible say? I hope you have your Bibles open to Matthew 18, 1 through 7. This passage begins with the disciples seeking to know how to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 1 of Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? These guys are jockeying for positions of greatness. They still did not understand Jesus' kingdom. They were thinking an earthly political kingdom, earthly power. But Jesus is about to show them that greatness is not found in his kingdom by seeking greatness. Amen. It's by humility. So Jesus probably shocked them to their core when he said that we must become like children to even enter the kingdom of heaven and we must have the humility of a child and recognize that our total dependence is on the Lord. So they're talking greatness, and he says, you gotta be the, you got to humble yourself. Amen. you got to get off this greatness attitude you've got and all that you've done, and you need to humble yourself. For, thank you before you can... You have to humble yourself and recognize without Christ, we are nothing and can't do anything. Without Christ, we can't enter the, head, the kingdom of heaven. Amen. We're totally dependent on him for everything. So look at what he does in verses 2 through 4. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then, look at, turn over to, hold, hold your spot in Matthew 18, through Mark chapter 10. Because here we see Jesus' love for children really demonstrated here. In both of these passages, that we see it in Mark 10 as well. Verses 13 through 16. It says that they were bringing children to him, that is Jesus, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked him. You know, why would they rebuke Jesus? They're bringing children to him. So that Jesus could bless them. And, uh, and the, the disciples are, no, no, you can't do that. We don't have time for that. He's too busy for that. He's too important for that. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant at the disciples and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hunt, hinder them. For such belongs to the kingdom of heaven. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Think of the tenderness of Jesus there with these children. Amen. Here is Jesus, the, the, you know, the Son of God, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then he's tenderly blessing and talking to children. Amen. What a beautiful picture. Now let's go back to Matthew 18, verses 5 and seven, five through 7. We see Jesus, and this is the point I really want us to get to for this sermon today. Jesus issued a warning that we must protect children from sin and not encourage them to sin. Beginning in verse 5, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom temptation comes. Of course, our society, for the most part, does not care about this warning Amen. because they don't believe about the truth of God's word. Amen. But the warning is the warning, nevertheless. 
Jesus is clear here that those who abuse children, those who lead them to sin, will face his judgment. Amen. The Lord loves children, and we must love children and protect them. This is a stark warning. Now, some people say, well, the little ones, the children he's talking about here, maybe those are little people in the faith. Well, could be, but I like to take Jesus. I think it applies there well, the little ones in the faith, people that are immature in their faith. I think it applies there well. But I'm taking everything in this passage today literally because he's, he's there. He's got a child in front of him. He's talking about children. And then he starts talking about leading the little ones to sin. Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better if he went ahead and drowned himself. That's what he's saying. That's heavy. Amen. That's serious. That's our Lord speaking about how serious he is about protecting children and, and, and leading children to him and not leading children to sin. Amen. And what, what I just talked about in the first section this morning, that is nothing but leading people away from God and towards sin. And it's pure evil. Amen. And I don't know why it takes our government so long to stop that. That should be the easiest thing in the world. Do you want children mutilated? Do you want children abused? No. And it should be a unanimous vote and sign in the law. And if you do it, you go to jail. Amen. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Amen. Don't play politics with our children. Amen. Ever. So they may not believe the words of Jesus. But Jesus, but them not believing the warning of Jesus doesn't change the warning of Jesus. I don't care if they're a politician that's endorsing this, a doctor that's performing it, or a parent that's allowing it. They will, without repenting before the Lord, they will face the judgment of God. Amen. Let's look at another passage. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. We're going to get into family now. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, we could say parents there. I don't think he's just, I don't think he's excluding mothers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Well, it does say don't provoke them to anger. I think in this case, we can interpret this to mean that. Uh, as another warning to not cause children to sin. Amen. Because if you, you can sin in your anger. Instead, if we, want, if we want to live a life that pleases the Lord, we must bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Amen. In other words, we need to not only teach them the word of God, we need to set an example for them. As people of God. Look, one more passage. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 4 through 7. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to who? To your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now, this was among the commands given to the people of Israel before they entered the promised land. What was in the promised land? It was a pagan country full of pagan gods and pagan influences. So, therefore, what is he saying to them? He's saying to them it is essential that the people knew the word of God, obediently lived the word of God, 
talk to their children about the Word of God in everyday conversations so that God's Word would be firmly planted in their children's hearts and minds. Amen. Think about how that is for us today. Amen. Think about today. We're living in a land where there's pagan gods and pagan influences. We're living in a land where there's evil everywhere and evil influences and evil is being normalized. Sin is being no has, has become more and more normalized. And those of us who believe the truth of God's word and believe in morality are considered hateful and bigots. <coughs> Wear it as a badge of honor if, if you get called that. So we're living in a similar society that they were. So what does it say to us? It's essential. If you have any influence over children at all, it's essential that we know the Word of God, that we obediently live the Word of God, that we talk to children about the Word of God in everyday conversations so that the Word of God is firmly planted in their lives. Amen. This is so vital for families and churches today. Why? Because the world is bombarding our children with sinful, destructive messages constantly. Amen. Therefore, we have to counter that. We must continually talk to our children about God's word to counter the lies this world's telling them. Amen. So what's our mission opportunity? You know the first one, pray. Pray for our children. Pray for your children, your grandchildren. I'll say this, even if your children are adults like mine and Carrie's, our adult children are raising our grandchildren. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray for any other children you know. Pray for children you don't know. Pray for the children during elementary. Amen. Pray for the children where you have grandchildren in school. Pray for our community. Pray that we will set a godly example for them. Amen. As I said earlier, pray for Christian teachers and school administrators who are being faithful to the Lord because I promise you, it's coming for them. Amen. Satan is evil. This is spiritual warfare. He's not going to let up. Amen. But we have... The armor of God, don't we? Amen. We have the Lord fighting our battles. Amen. We're on his side. Notice I didn't say he's on our side. We're on his side. Amen. And here's another prayer request. Pray for the salvation of those who are sexualizing children. Amen. Amen. Pray for their salvation. They desperately need to be saved. Another point is guide your children in the truth of God's word. Uh, as I said, they're being, they're being bombarded by evil influences every day. We, we have to, I don't want to use the word bombard, but we need to lovingly cover them with, with God's word. Amen. Another one, protect your children from harmful environments. I remember when when Courtney was in high school, she wanted to go somewhere with some friends. It probably was a fine place, but I'd never been there, knew nothing about it, knew nothing about the adults there. She told me who was going to be there, the students and their parents were going to be there, chaperoning. I knew nothing about any of them. So you know what Carrie and I said? Nope, you can't go. We were not very popular with her for a while. She thought we were just the most mean parents that night. But we were right. Amen. It's better to be considered a mean parent than put your child in a situation that's not a child-friendly environment. Amen. In our, our world today, it's not, is not a child-friendly environment. And it's not the places, just the places they physically go, it's the places they go online. Amen. If, if you are, if you, here's a suggestion to share with your, with your children who have children. If you pay for their cell phone, 
or their, or their access to the to online, check it. Amen. Put, put whatever you call it on there so they can't go to certain places. Amen. If they get mad at you, they have an alternative. Turn the phone, turn the computer back in. You pay it for it, you call the shot. See, I, here's, here's what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful our children did grow up in this, in this internet crazy thing. Amen. They grew up with flip phones, and they thought we were the meanest things because we wouldn't give them a flip cell phone until they turned 16 and got the driver's license. And Jeremy tried to, to, to in, his, in his own persuasive way, persuade, give us all these reasons why he needed a phone, why he needed a phone. We had an answer for every one of them. And so when Courtney turns 16, she starts. He told her, Courtney, give it up. <laughs> I tried everything I could think of. They're not going to give in. And neither one of them liked us very much for just a little while. But we were okay with that. Amen. Now they see the wisdom of that. Even then, in that time, when it was nothing like it is today, it's so much worse today. We have to protect the places they go online. Amen. We need to lovingly talk to them about why they cannot go to those places and, and, and go to those certain websites. And we base that on the, on the truth of God's word because it does not honor God, because it's evil, it, it, of, of whatever reasons. Amen. Talk to your children. Talk to children. Yes. Also stay informed about the destructive influences on our children. When I say our children, I'm talking about the children of society. Now, you may or may not have been shocked by some of the things I shared at the beginning. You may have heard all of that. You probably heard worse. Sadly, what I shared with you was just the tip of the iceberg. We could have been here a while. Amen. But here, here's the bottom line, my friends. We are in a spiritual warfare. Amen. And Satan has set his sights on children, and sadly, many people are willing to be his accomplices. Amen. And again, we need for those who are willing to be his accomplices, we need to pray for their salvation. Because that's the only thing that's going to change them. Amen. So we must also fight the battle. We cannot, what we cannot do is put our heads in the sand pretending that our children are not under assault. Amen. We must be informed because here's, here's, the, here's the question, and then I'm done. If as Christians, if we don't protect our children, I mean the children of our community, the children of the nation. If we don't do something to protect our children, who will? Amen. No one else will. Preach. You cannot, we cannot expect that the that, that government's going to get it right. <coughs> they get almost nothing right. Amen. If, if there's not money in it for them, they're not going to make a decision based on what's right and wrong. And it's so easy here to know what is right and what is wrong. Amen. And we need to be in the battle. Yes. And if you, if you, if, I thought say, if all you can do is pray, but if you can pray, I encourage you to make, if you want prayer to be your number one a mission in this area, then I challenge you to pray fervently about this. Pray daily. Don't pray a quick prayer every day. Pray, don't pray a general prayer. Know what you're praying about. Amen. Pray about the things we've talked about today. Pray, 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 pray. Prayer can break down the walls that Satan's building. Amen. Prayer can destroy the enemy. Amen. We see that in scripture. We know it's true. You know, I, I don't want to get to heaven 
the Lord asked me, why didn't you do more to protect children? I don't want something to happen to one of my children, one of your children, grandchildren, and think back and say, what can we have done more? What can we have done more? Let me, one final word. I thought I was done. By the way, you know when a preacher says one final word, that's not always one final word. Amen. We will say it's the Holy Spirit and hope it is. I mentioned teachers. We got young people. We got young people in our schools who are faithfully and obediently doing the right thing. They're faithfully loving the Lord and obeying the Lord and and, and wanting, to, wanting to do what the Lord tells them to do and follow and obey the word. Pray for these young people. Amen. Because by believing in the truth of God's word that there are only two genders and believing the truth of God's word that God makes you male and he makes you female and he does not make a mistake. By believing that homosexual behavior is a sin. By believing that that you should not transition to another gender because that is against nature, it's against science, it's against biology, it's against the Word of God. By believing those things, young people are being talked about and mocked Amen. and hated for it. Amen. So pray for them. Amen. Encourage them if you know some. Encourage them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. Lord, it absolutely breaks my heart to see what is, what is going on in this world today. I mentioned several issues and didn't even get into the whole sex trafficking issue. Because that's, that's damaging and destroying the lives of so many young people. Lord, it broke my heart recently when I discovered that the average age, that, that runaways, that runaways in Georgia, the average age of a runaway, when a runaway, run, a teenager or a child runs away from home, within 48 hours, a sex trafficker has made contact with them. And the average age of a young person entering into prostitution is 14 years old. Oh God help us. This is the world we're living in and we can no longer sit back and say it's somebody else's responsibility, it's somebody else's job, it's not mine. We can't sit back and say my children are grown I don't have any responsibility. If we love children and want to protect them and so it's because we're your children we're Christians we're your followers we have an obligation to do something to fight the battle to fight the battle in Jesus name we pray Amen, Amen. our hymn of decision is hymn 632 child of the king you need to respond publicly anyway. Why don't you come as we stand and sing?